This is Big Ideas from the ABC. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm Tavi Gevinson. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. The name of this thing is Tavi's World, uh, which was largely inspired by this. <laughs> and also by this. Seriously, though, I'm really psyched to be here and completely honored that the Writers' Festival would have me. I've spent months working on this talk. I'm sorry, I've spent months procrastinating working on this talk because this is an extremely scary thing to be doing. Um, being asked to share my world with you makes me feel like I should have some huge secret to, like, unleash and blow all your minds, and I don't have that. I, um... I just, I don't feel like I have anything terribly new to say. I've been thinking a lot lately about originality and authenticity, and that's really what got me all blocked up whenever I tried to work on this, that pressure, especially as it's associated with youth. And it's actually all at a point now where doing what I am now, calling myself out for being cliched, is cliched, so I'm like all out of options. This is something I believe a lot of rookie readers think about too, because we tend to attract the kind of girls who want to create things and be heard. And it's a very common fear that those things won't happen among people our age today, I think, because of the internet. Uh, like it's democratic and everyone can have a voice, but it also is intimidating to try and stand out. And it's also hard to create things to share to begin with because it feels like everything has already been said and every story's already been told and every song's already been sung and they've all been written online, archived online. So that's where we'll start today. Like, um, okay, an anecdote, if you will. <laughs> Last week, my boyfriend and I broke up. It's fine, we're back together now. <laughs> um, but at the time, it was awful. Um, and it was my first breakup, and I'm 17, and my body is supposed to be biologically more emotional than it will be at any other time in my life. So it hit me really hard. And uh, it was drawn out for weeks, and throughout that time, I talked to a lot of people about dealing with these feelings. Friends my age, friends who are married and have kids, uh, artists, writers, directors, a photographer, a musician, two girls in front of me at a Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> and I was told repeatedly, this is the stuff all the great art is about. It's another experience to be inspired by. You'll use this one day. <laughs> another anecdote. Almost a year ago, when I was 16 and halfway through 11th grade, I was diagnosed with depression, and uh, it sucked, obviously. But at first, I was like, yes! <laughs> like, I'm a crazy artist. I have the seal of approval from the 27 Club, and I'm gonna compete in the tortured Olympics, and the harder I make things for myself, the more legit my art is. Sidebar, there's a really good book about the crazy artist myth and mental illness called Marbles by Ellen Forney, and I highly recommend it. But anyways, yeah, use your heartbreak. Yeah, crazy artist. If you've read any of my writing on Rookie, you know I am 100% of the school of thought that is very feel everything always and live life to the fullest and everything is material. But then these sad things happened, and I tried to actually make art, and I couldn't. I literally had nothing to say. I didn't feel inspired or special. I just felt at a total loss for words, totally overwhelmed. Trying to make anything actually just made me feel twice as sad because not only was my heart broken or not only was I depressed, but nothing I was writing about it was good. <laughs> uh, like none of my metaphors were unique. All of my imagery was really cheesy. Um, I continually read over what I had so far and felt like I was reading a teenager's diary on a sitcom that was filled out by the middle-aged props master. <laughs> named Jeff. <laughs> I was not being original and this drove me nuts. And I have a deep-rooted inferiority complex about being original because I wouldn't have a public life, a creative life. I wouldn't be speaking to you now if not for the internet. Something about that has always made me feel a little impure. 
Um, not only because what I do wouldn't get exposure in a pre-internet world, but also because I wouldn't even be doing it. I hated writing when I was younger. It wasn't until I'd been keeping up my blog for a while that I realized, like, oh, I had been doing it for years and I did like it. Um, every cool thing I know about, every band or movie that means anything to me, I know about from the internet. So part of what worries me is the fact that all of my references are traceable. Everything I do or say could be tracked down and exposed as being heavily influenced by a book I've written about before. I'll never seem like Bjork. Like, I'll never seem like some magical woodland creature who came out of nowhere with, like, impeccable taste and a never-ending set of skills and, like, a lantern. <laughs> um, like, all this artistic ability and no one to credit for any of it. It's just, it's too late for me. Uh, so I've begun to understand the danger of trying to find justification for bad things happening in your life by believing that you will one day make it all into a wildly popular show on HBO and feel validated by the whole world. <laughs> because what if you write a show people hate? Or what if you write a show that doesn't get made? Or what if you don't even write a show not even for yourself because you just don't have it in you? I know that sounds bleak. Uh, the last thing I want to do is discourage anyone from being creative. But this is not about not being creative, original, ambitious, or finding release. This is about a certain kind of creativity and originality and ambition and release. This is about fangirling. I know if you're a rookie reader, you might know what I'm talking about when I say that teenagers are consistently told to be bold and be unique and Lady Gaga and own whatever it is that makes us special. And yeah, absolutely own it. But I just don't think not feeling special should feel like a failure, especially when you're still trying to figure out who you are and what you like. Instead, it can make you feel like part of the greater chain of being, not in a conformist way, but just in a way that is kind of comforting. Um, because what if when you're in a mood, when you feel sad and stuck, it's just more therapeutic for you to write down someone else's words than your own? The only thing that made me feel better in those times of need was writing out lyrics to Disappear by Beyonce. And finally, all the awful feelings I was going through were not so burdensome, because even if I would not one day be Beyonce, whoa. <laughs> um, I could relate to Beyonce. And that made me feel less alone, and that made me happy. And I kind of just decided I don't care about being original or unique or having an artistic identity or having to stress out about any of that. I just want to be happy. <laughs> and, and being a fan can be the most happying thing you can be because you feel connected to other people and you realize these feelings pass through all of us and they have for years and years and years and you'll be okay. So. When I was asked to speak here, I realized most of the work I have to show you is other people's. Most of my world is a composite of the worlds of others. These are all Beyonce lyrics. I've just sort of always been more satisfied this way. Uh, I started a fashion blog when I was 11, you heard about that. And um, I went to fashion week for a few years, for quite a few seasons, and it turned out that I was just happier looking at style.com in my room. It was so much more magical, you guys. And it's not that I'd had bad experiences in fashion, but when I look back on that time in my life, I have so few memories of it. Like, I really have to dig for them. And all the special stuff that comes to mind first that really shaped me was, you know, sitting on my bed and reading magazines and feeling like I was getting a secret message from another planet. And I think if you are able to eliminate economies like fame or a conventional idea of success, you become really comfortable with your own level of ambition as a content observer of things. As editor of Rookie, my job is really to curate, to find talented people, to tell their own stories. So this fangirling thing works out for me on a professional level, like I consider part of my job to be a professional fangirl. <laughs> but it's also kind of become my personal religion and how I see the world. 
Now this little I'm just a fan thing is not to be taken as playing the underdog. Because here's the thing, fangirling is not pure, purely about the subject of your fandom, it's actually almost entirely a reflection of you. And that is awesome. <laughs> On the 20 hour plane ride here, I watched David Attenborough's 60 Years in the Making. And for me, I obviously love watching the animals and nature is great and stuff, but Attenborough is really the reason I was so taken with it because he's so enthusiastic and so passionate and it's so inspiring. Then I watched One Direction Up All Night Live <laughs> and I just kept feeling like, okay, fellas, you're all fine and cute and good for you and whatever, but what I really want to know about are these wildly crazed fans who are so obviously the more interesting part of the equation of that band's success. <laughs> like, I just wanted to hear Attenborough being like, watch as Harry Styles adjusts his blazer. <laughs> A steady breeze, but his hair, it doesn't move. <laughs> and obviously, yeah, there's a difference between doing decades of research and work like Attenborough has done, and then, like, knowing Harry's favorite food. But what I'm interested in here is the enthusiasm and the refusal to try and act cool and disaffected and just what it is to love something is really a religion. Uh, these are a few books that have taught me how to be a fan and be passionate and develop my own personal religion of the things I love. The first on the left is called Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonder by Lawrence Weschler. It's about a place in Los Angeles called the Museum of Jurassic Technology which is in the style of the world's very first museums in that it's not an art museum or a natural history museum, it's just a collection of cool stuff. Like when museums started, they were just like, take all the cool things in the world, put them in one place. Um, one room just has a bunch of oil paintings of every dog that's ever been to outer space. And there's also um, a collection of uh, like tiny sculptures of Disney characters that are so small they fit in the eye of a needle and you have to look at them through a microscope. It's amazing. And um, the book is also about the museum's founder, David Wilson, and it reveals that some of the museum is somewhat fabricated by him as well, uh, all in the interest of getting the visitor to question what in the building is real, to really inspire them to wonder. Weschler writes in the book, it's that very shimmer the capacity for such delicious confusion, Wilson sometimes seems to suggest, that may constitute the most blessedly wonderful thing about being human. And when I talk about seeking out those things which make you wonder and drive you, and I call it a religion, I think of how, in the book, Wilson's wife says that back when he first realized this museum was what he wanted to do with his life, he had the air of a religious fanatic. Um, I got to interview him for Rookie back in November, around the same time I was diagnosed, and I asked him, do you ever feel like there's a shortage of wonder in the world? And he laughed and said it had never crossed his mind. And I asked, well, do you ever worry that you might be incapable of appreciating it? And he said that if you think of yourself as that separate from the rest of the world, which is a very easy way to feel, especially at our age, you might be incapable of seeing the wonder, but if you're open, if you want to be connected, you can be in a lot of unexpected ways. Um, now, I absolutely have the angsty middle school girl thing where I don't want to relate to things. <laughs> um, whoa. <laughs> or where I'm worried that being able to compare my life to a piece of art would somehow make my feelings less special or legitimate. But learning to have the same kind of openness as David Wilson to search for wonder the way he does has made me see that connectedness as adding value to my feelings instead of detracting from them. <laughs> this was like the one photo I could find of her smiling. <laughs> the middle book here, I Love Dick, is by a woman named Chris Kraus. At the start of the book, she's struggling to complete an independent film she hasn't written in years, feels totally uninspired, like she's really fallen into the role of wife of, instead of like her own person. Uh, so she has dinner with her husband and his colleague named Dick, and she barely knows the guy, yet she becomes infatuated with him. And the book becomes all these letters to him, meditations on love and art criticism, and he continually rejects her. 
He doesn't read most of the letters. He doesn't answer them. He asks her to stop ruining his life. Um, but by the end of the book, it doesn't matter because none of it ever had anything to do with him in the first place. His existence gave Chris someone to project a lot of stuff onto, and that is what drives her to eventually find her own voice, show her film, and publish this amazing book. This is from a letter Jean-Paul Sartre wrote Simone de Beauvoir that reminds me a lot of Chris. Tonight I love you in a way that you have not known in me. I am neither worn down by travels nor wrapped up in the desire for your presence. I am mastering my love for you and turning it inwards as a constituent element of myself. The seemingly self-protective, embarrassed, proud part of me that's made me ashamed of fangirling or of saying how I feel in a positive way uh, has really been helped along by taking on this attitude that this is just because I feel things strongly and I have the ability to love things and that has nothing to do with Harry Styles. Uh, and it's worked out. Now the book on the right is Franny and Zoe by J.D. Salinger. And plug your ears if you haven't read it because I'm about to kind of ruin it. Um, Franny and Zoe are a sister and a brother in a family of child prodigies. And now they're growing up and Franny is having a bit of a crisis. She breaks down, studies all these different religions, mumbles this prayer over and over to herself wherever she goes. She's basically searching for, comes, for some kind of sincerity and earnestness after a childhood of being told she's better than everyone else and of being programmed to rank everyone by level of intellect. And at the very end of the book, her brother Zoe kind of gives her the answer and gives her her religion. He reminds her that when they were little and they went on radio shows to entertain people with their wit, their older brother Seymour would tell them to do it for the fat lady, like he had an idea of a woman sitting at home really excited to hear this show. And you do a good show for her and she's not any better or worse than a highly respected college professor. Then Zoe wraps it all up and says, there isn't anyone anywhere who isn't Seymour's fat lady. And don't you know who that fat lady really is? It's Christ himself. So I've always kept this book in mind because it seems to suggest the highest calling, the supreme being, is a fan, is the person who's open and wants to love things and feel connected. Um, so what if the stuff that makes you fan out isn't super sophisticated? Uh, well, in Daniel Klaus's book and movie Ghost World, uh, the main character Enid seems to find God in what most would consider trashy a really bad comedian, a lousy fake 50s diner, a cheesy dinosaur theme park. There's a wonderful essay about this by Joshua Glenn in the Daniel Klaus Reader that I unfortunately can't just repeat word for word because it's perfect, but it pulls together all these interviews and parts from other Daniel Klaus books to prove the validity of trash culture, like all the stuff Enid likes or comic books or really bad science fiction. Enid is not a jaded hipster who loves this stuff ironically. She sees a genuine earnestness and humanity in it all, and that keeps her from becoming jaded. I mean, just look at John Waters. He is the happiest person alive. <laughs> and he loves a lot of trashy stuff. Um, a book and movie that's also helped me for my personal religion is The Virgin Suicides. It's uh, narrated by a bunch of grown men trying to figure out why these sisters they used to crush on from afar as teenagers all killed themselves. The worship here goes two ways, one being that the girls have strict parents who keep them trapped inside, they even stop going to school, and so any sign of the outside world, like rock records or travel brochures, becomes their source of magic and wonder and faith. And the other worshiping happens in how the boys idealize these girls till they barely exist. Um, Roger Ebert pointed out that this makes the story much more about the boys than most people realize. Ebert wrote, when the Lisbon girls kill themselves, do not blame their deaths on their weird parents. Mourn for the passing of everyone you knew and everyone you were in the last summer before sex. Mourn for the idealism of inexperience. In other words, mourn for the idealism of loving things from afar, um, being a fangirl. There's one scene in the movie that always gets me, where one of the sisters and her date win queen and king at a school dance. 
and it's the happiest she'll ever be in her short life because later that night they do have sex and he leaves her there on the football field and the idealism of inexperience vanishes. But first they go up there and balloons fall down and they get their crowns and the song Strange Magic by Electric Light Orchestra plays. And it's just so the perfect, earnest, sad, 70s suburban symphony. So strange magic has become shorthand for my own wonder or fat lady or dick. Um, <laughs> shown here is a hundred page zine I made that I have hardly ever shown to anyone about all of this stuff. Um, this is one spread of a list I keep in one of my journals of moments of strange magic organized by real life and then fiction and then imagination. Um, Last summer, my friend and rookie photographer Petra Collins and I made an installation at Space 1520 in Los Angeles, also inspired by all this. We took a road trip with other rookie staffers from New York to LA and held events with our readers in 16 different cities and asked them to bring us a piece of strange magic of their own. So we got friendship bracelets and pictures of friends and CDs, and we added them all to a bunch of junk of our own to create kind of like our dream teen bedroom. <laughs> it was full of shrines and all kind of iconography and that reminds me of this part from I Love Dick where Chris writes to Dick, you're shrunk and bottled in a glass jar. You're a portable saint. Knowing you's like knowing Jesus. There are billions of us and only one of you, so I don't expect much from you personally. There are no answers to my life, but I'm touched by you and fulfilled just by believing. That same friend Petra and I also visited a place in California called Salvation Mountain. Basically, in the 1970s, technically 1980, but 70 sounds better, um, a guy named Leonard Knight was driving through the desert, running away from some awful thing he'd done, and his car broke down. And then he had this like religious experience in the desert, and as a result, he spent years building this giant mountain out of clay and hay and paint, and all over it, it just says, God is love, and the universe, and Jesus, and like verses from the Bible. And um, to me, it's just, you know, what was so amazing was that he committed to it, that his love manifested in this way. Uh, these are some photos we took there for Rookie. We wanted them to feel like his mountain is its own little world. When I started becoming a fangirl, I began seeing the world through the eyes of other people in a very thrilling way. It just satisfies some hyper-obsessive part of me to be able to kind of catalog something like a song to turn emotions into a kind of math. So these are pages from when I was color coding Stevie Nicks lyrics by stuff like mentions of animals, types of weather, types of light. For this one, I went through every song from the album Red by Taylor Swift and picked out every line that described a place and mapped them all out. And then this one I made for my friend who loves Lana Del Rey, where I drew and mapped out her lyrics across America. I've also started looking more closely at what makes my relationship to the things that I like specific to me in the interest of coming to see fangirling as a reflection of myself. In my art class last year, one assignment was to draw your walk to school. So I did mine by all the buildings I pass and all the association, associations I've made between them and movie or musician or whatever throughout the years. So the 7-Eleven reminds me of the Galaxy 500 song Strange, which makes a trip there less bleak. And like, it's 3 a.m. and I want food. Um, the line of houses makes uh, me think of the movie American Beauty, making the sameness kind of endearing. And the hill by my school reminds me of my so-called life, because you've got your hill and your train and your fence and kids smoking and your field below, and then all the angst just becomes like kind of bittersweet and something to cherish instead of loathe. 
Another thing I've enjoyed doing is finding what's common among different things I love. So this is something I made where I began cataloging different types of light and uh, making note of all the appearances they would make in my favorite movies and songs and such and memories. Note cards turned out to be an easier system for this, and I've also started decks for cataloging uh, like types of plants and buildings, but I'm most attracted to light because of what it means in most literature. It symbolizes some kind of truth or faith, like strange magic, if you will. Uh, for example, headlights are mentioned in both Tiny Dancer by Elton John and Treacherous by Taylor Swift, so those are both on that card. Or for Glow, I have a note about Ghost World because I read that Daniel Klaus printed that book in that one light blue color because he wanted to recreate that eerie glow that comes from TV. I also have down a personal memory of people watching with my boyfriend and marveling at the glow in all these different apartments across the street. And on that card, there's also a fun fact that I just think is kind of cool. Uh, when a non-digital TV is between stations and it's all fuzzy static, about 10% of what you see is caused by photons left over from the Big Bang. So, you know, now watching TV makes me feel like really connected to the universe. <laughs> um, I became less ashamed of having all these obvious references and using elements from all this stuff that came before me when I read this bit from a Virginia Woolf interview. She's talking about words and writing specifically, so it's different, but I think it still applies. Words, English words, are full of echoes, of memories, of associations. Naturally, they've been out and about on people's lips, in their houses, in the streets, in the fields for so many centuries. And that is one of the chief difficulties in writing them today, that they are so stored with meanings, with memories, that they have contracted so many famous marriages. Our business is to see what we can do with the English language as it is. How can we combine the old words in new orders so that they survive, so that they create beauty, so that they tell the truth? That is the question. So you don't really have a choice but to use all of these past things and try and put them together in a new way. Uh, like These are just some examples of ways I've tried to create order out of the things I love of the past. Just all these connections made among uh, colors and album art and songs and books and food and memories. Uh, this is from that road trip we were on. Uh, we were listening to the Rolling Stones and we passed a sign that said Red Lion Road, which made me think of their song Ruby Tuesday, which made me think of that song where, that scene where that song plays in the Royal Tenenbaums where they're sitting in a yellow tent and um, they're like surrounded by this wallpaper that has lions and other animals on it. Then we passed a bunch of little rainbow buildings that kind of looked like circus tents. And the rainbow part also made me think of the Rolling Stones song, She's a Rainbow. So it all kind of came together and I felt like I was seeing an embodiment of their music all around me and it was really cool and not at all affected by like three weeks of being in a car. <laughs> um, this one's like too complicated. I don't, it's like trying to read your own handwriting. I don't even know, but. There's more. Um, with my journals, it's been largely satisfying to make each one feel like a catalog of a specific world made up of all these different associations that seem to go together. And for the period of time that I'm using that journal, I'll make everything in my life match it. My handwriting, my outfits, the music I listen to, the photos and drawings that might go in the diary. The way I used to use my blog and personal style as outlets for playing with identity and feeling like a new person, now I put all of that into just everything. And having some kind of aesthetic parallel for whatever is happening in my life at that time can make it feel like it makes more sense or like there's a place for it in the world or like it can even be beautiful. Like when I was depressed and then I had to start changing the way I think, I made my journal feel like a scientist's notebook or when I had boy drama in 10th grade and sort of learned the virgin suicides lesson that like crushing is more fun than that other stuff. Uh, my journal then was all like sad love songs from the 70s and glittery pink childish daydream stuff. I realized recently that when we think about personal identity, when we imagine ourselves, we picture ourselves from the outside. Like when I think Tavi, like I think of my face and my body through the world's eyes. 
instead of what to me is a more accurate representation of who I am, and that's the world through my eyes. Um, and it sounds like hippie BS, but when I feel like my hair looks bad or I'm all greasy, I'm able to just stop caring by thinking like, well, I don't have to look at it. Like, this isn't a part of my world. You're all my world. <laughs> like, I'm looking at everything else. Um, and when I do feel like purely a set of eyes, I think that's really when I'm happiest. Being interested in finding associations among the objects of my fangirlism and in finding the aesthetic parallel to a concept also helps with the monthly theme format we have on Rookie. So paradise was all California and freedom was all suburban. Transformation felt all 1960s and up all night was New Year's Eve and partying and glitter. And this comes into play with the books we do too. Last year we put out Rookie Yearbook One and this October, yearbook two will come out. And one of my favorite parts on working on them was getting to make it feel like a new book every 30 pages when the theme changes and the layout changes. Now, fangirling, internalizing fangirling, has worked out quite well for me, but there are dangers I've encountered. One is something you just have to get over, which is realizing your feelings are not all that special. <laughs> Uh, that's fine, you're part of the human race, be David Wilson, etc. Two is that you might look uncool for expressing enthusiasm. That's okay because anyone who might accuse you of being uncool for doing that just is not focusing on the right things and is not a good friend. Three is that you hide behind your tastes instead of understanding what makes them specific to you and you start to see other people the same way and then everyone just becomes a collection of Facebook likes and they fit into all these random classifications of like what they're allowed to like, and that's no fun, and it takes nuance out of everything. So let others like stuff the same way you like stuff unto you. <laughs> mm. um, four is that you want to create your own art, but you get all stifled because you feel so intimidated by all the stuff you fangirl over. You feel like you could never live up to all your influences, so you just give up entirely. Um, there's a really good TED talk about this called Pressure, Power, Punk Rock, where this girl, Emma, talks about loving punk musicians so much that she was too scared to even try and make her own punk music. And she wraps it up really well with uh, a singing from the punk community, Kill Your Idols. And she interprets it as to just forget about the passing of the torch, stop worshiping your heroes, humanize them, and understand you have a place right next to them. The fifth danger is that you become really obsessed with an artist or writer or whatever, and you worship them, and you take their word as gospel, and then you grow out of it and feel stupid, or you realize they are a total asshole. <laughs> um, then what you need to do is, First, if they're accessible and what they did was actually offensive to you, not out of taste, but because they're showing some kind of prejudice or ignorance, you can write to them or tweet at them or comment on their article, and that's good, and they should appreciate that. The second thing you need to do is accept that a lot of fangirlism ends in learning that the thing you liked didn't mean what you thought it did or isn't important to you now, but you still shouldn't feel all silly and stupid because of it. Artists are, according to history, not the most reliable people. And um, meaning changes, it's malleable, it's interpreted differently by everyone. But the truth you once saw in a poem exists not in like a thorough analysis of the words on the page, but in the moment in which you felt like you received a gift of clarity and comfort from the universe. It lies in the magic of the coincidence that you should come across this work at just the right time. A couple weeks ago, we had a rookie event in LA where I interviewed Rashida Jones. And one thing she emphasized about growing up and getting to know yourself is the importance of understanding just how much your feelings are a reflection of you and not of other stuff. She said, when you have an idol, you're like, oh my God, I think that person's so amazing. And then you find out they're horrible. And you're like, oh right, because the reason I think that person is amazing is because they're reflecting something amazing in me. When you love someone, you're the one who's doing the loving. You're the person who's great enough to give that love. It's not about that other person. Again, let me remind you. <laughs> At the beginning of last summer, 
pre-road trip, pre-diagnosis, pre-breakup, I was in a mood, duh. And I was like, I, was, I couldn't get through a normal conversation with anyone. I was kind of just a mess. I, none of my pop culture tools were even working because everything was just too much. Like it was like, oh, I can't handle the virgin suicides right now. <laughs> um, and I just have this memory of lying in my parents' bed and this soft yellow light coming from the lamp on the floor over in the corner. And my dad telling me about an evolutionary biologist, paleontologist, and science historian named Stephen Jay Gould. In 2002, at the end of his life, in a book called The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, published two months before his death, he wrote this. We care because the broad events that had to happen happened to happen in a certain particular way. Something almost unspeakably holy, I don't know how else to say this, underlies our discovery and confirmation of the actual details that made our world, and also, in realms of contingency, assured the minutia of its construction in the manner we know, and not in any one of a trillion other ways, nearly all of which would not have included the evolution of a scribe to record the beauty, the cruelty, the fascination, and the mystery. So this guy spent his whole life studying evolution, trying to account for the reality of the physical world and how it works. And at the end of his life, even he had to admit that there was something miraculous about it. Not just that beauty and art and nature can exist, but that we can appreciate it at all. He says this whole universe thing could have happened any number of ways. Evolution could have gone in a lot of different directions but it is unspeakably holy, his words, that it happened so that we as humans could enjoy it, could record its history, could be a scribe, as he says, or a fangirl, as I do. It's only natural at this point in our evolution to feel the side effects of all this and to feel unoriginal, but that's not shameful. That's a reflection of the fangirl's ability to love and of the world's ability to be that source of wonder and object of desire. The end. <laughs> um, speaking of fangirling, um, I have to tell you that when you were first confirmed as one of the guests of the Melbourne Writers' Festival, I immediately got about 13 text messages just, oh, cool. and they were all just, Tommy, <laughs> like capital letters, 17 exclamation marks. Um, yeah. And they were all from women my age, which I think is interesting. <laughs> so you've got a, you've got a pretty big, um, broad fan base. How do you feel about that? I think it's nice. Uh, like once there was this article that was like, hey creepy adults, stop using Rookie to live out your nostalgia. <laughs> and we were like, we don't make the teenage experience seem like a wonderful thing. <laughs> I think women in their 20s or older read it because a lot of those things are universal. Like I have a theory that a teenager is just like a caricature of a real person. Because you feel everything extra strongly and you are experiencing everything for the first time. So I think people still deal with the stuff that we do. Yeah. Um, like throughout their whole lives, it doesn't get better. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, because usually when I read Rookie, I'm like usually just kind of going, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's really amazing. I haven't progressed at all in 15 years. That's great. <laughs> Um, so, Tavi, you've been in Australia for about a week now, is mm -hmm. it? Um, and I heard you visited Hanging Rock. How was that? Uh, it was beautiful. Yeah. I went with my friend Brody and a rookie illustrator, Minna, and uh, it was gorgeous. We saw a rainbow. We did not slip into another dimension and disappear. <laughs> um, it was a successful trip. Your clothes, like, stayed the same color. They didn't, yeah. like, crazily go red somehow. <laughs> right. to illustrate something weird that happened, that's good. Um, and uh, what else have you been up to? Uh, hanging out, uh, did some shopping today. Um, yeah, shop, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think she, I think she said where. 
oh, I thought you were just like, yeah, shopping. <laughs> Um, Alpha 60, Kinky Girlinky, Alice Euphemia, and some vintage stores. Um, that would have been really weird if you were just like, woohoo, shopping! <laughs> uh, yeah, no, shopping, seeing friends, working on my talk. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, I think now, like, every teenager is like, see, Tavi went shopping, Mama can go shopping now. Um, <laughs> And, yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask you a little bit more about fangirling. So you talked a little bit about um, a few books that you really love. Um, and we know you're a big Taylor Swift fan. Mm. And you talked about, you know, One Direction and Justin Bieber um, and all the men who have hair that is long. Um, what other obsessions do you have at the moment? Oh, I have so many. Um, probably, like, the three albums I listen to at least once a week are Red by Taylor Swift, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy by Kanye West, and Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. Those are probably my staples. Um, but I don't know. I've been watching Inside Amy Schumer and New Girl and Mindy Project. Um... I haven't really... Oh, I just... I got into Joanna Newsom recently. That was an experience. Um, <laughs> she goes with Bjork as one of those, like, magical people where you're like, where did you come from? So, yeah. I heard a story about Joanna Newsom that I think her father is a literature professor, mm -hmm. um, and when she was little, like, they'd play a game, and it wouldn't be, like, tag or whatever. Her dad would... Um, put a little a, a pin or a different word to each tree, and she'd have to run to each tree and make a poem about the word that was on the tree, which actually explains a lot about Joanna Newsom, if you know. Yeah, that. if you had told me, like, make up a story about Joanna Newsom, I would have said just that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, and have you, I had a rumor that you'd, you've seen Summer Heights High, is that true? Have you seen? Yeah, I was, <laughs> I kind of wanted to do, like, when Jemay is at the assembly, and she's like, oh, how did my modeling pictures get in there? Oh, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> I, like, wanted to do that as a joke, but then, like, some people would get it, and everyone else would just be like, you are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so I let that one go. Yeah. I can't imagine anyone's walking away from this going, Tavi's the worst, you guys. Um, so, okay, so we noticed in your really amazing uh, presentation. You write a lot of lists, and apart from that, you're also an editor-in-chief at Rookie. You're a writer, you're a sometimes stylist and an actress. Um, so it seems to me, who's a chronic napper, that you get a lot done during the week. Um, and you're also going to high school. So I think, you know, on a personal level, I'd just kind of like to know how you do everything so that I can maybe take some notes. And... <laughs> um. I have been told that the trick to not procrastinating is to have so much to do that you can't. So that's part of it. Um, that being said, I also make time for relaxing, but I, like, understand the urgency of it. I think I've just had too many incidents where, like, everything's gotten to a really bad point, and I've just kind of, like, broken down, that I know now the urgency of only doing things that are important to me and, like, taking care of myself when I do get stressed out. So I don't, like, I'm just not, you know, I have really wonderful friends and they, we always have a great time and they, mean, they make me feel good about myself and I don't do any of the, like, social high school stuff that makes me feel weird that, like, everyone still feels obligated to do. Or, you know, I do my rookie work, but I really do kind of have to filter the opportunities that come through or, like, see what I'm really passionate about. Um, yeah, you just, I think you just have to, like, really zone in on what's important. And, the, and I think you realize that the more you resist the urge to do stupid stuff, like check Facebook to hate people, um, like, the more it becomes, the easier it gets. Like, it becomes less and less of an impulse to check Facebook the less you do it, which is so simple but took me so long to figure out. So I guess that's it. Yeah. And not to be weird about this or anything, but so... <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, how did they let this stalker on the stage? Um, 
you, um, but let's break it down. So you go to school, kind yeah. of normal school hours, and then you come home and you kind of do work for a couple of hours, then you, you know. Yeah, I'll, well, um, if I want to hang out with friends or whatever, like just not be home, I'll like check my email on my phone and if nothing is urgent, if I don't have a pressing deadline, I will do that. Um, but when that doesn't happen, yeah, I'll like go home, check email, probably work for a couple hours, relax, do homework somewhere in there. Um, I don't, I mean, I have, I've managed to bargain a few study halls during the school day. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I started my blog when I was 11 and now I am kind of, at first I was like, this isn't work, that's just fun. But like writing something every day is work. It takes up a lot of time. So I think I'm just kind of like in the routine. Not that like child labor is good, <laughs> but I, I guess because it's like been part of my development, I just get things done. Yeah. Um, and speaking of school, is it true that there's a class at your school called Feelings? Yeah. <laughs> I will not be taking it. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, a, I think it changes a lot of kids' lives. I know the teacher because he's been like a family friend since, because my dad worked at my high school. So I've known him since I was little, and then I was in a play at school that he directed. But I just don't want to talk about, I, I talk about my feelings enough, so. <laughs> Your whole life is feelings. <laughs> That's um, true. <laughs> so, um, as a lot of you probably know, you did a great TED talk about how teenage girls and people, by extension, are contradictory creatures. Um, and you're a really visible spokesperson for all things teen. And I'm sure you get asked for a lot of advice by teenagers. Are there any mm -hmm. questions that you get asked a lot? And what advice do you generally give? Um, I think the biggest thing is how do you juggle everything? And then also like a couple days ago, I spoke, I like did a couple sessions at Wesley College um, where all of these really lovely girls asked questions. And I was talking about like, you know, asserting yourself and having to just kind of like shove away the voice in your head that makes you insecure. And this girl was like, yes, but sometimes we have mental breakdowns. <laughs> and I was like, that's true. So, I, I mean, I do get that a lot, just like, what do you do when everything is wrong? I think you, I think just the more, another Rashida Jones nugget of wisdom is, um, she said this at the interview, and she says this in her movie, Celeste and Jesse Forever. She says, it doesn't get better, but you get better. And I think that's true. Like, the more, uh, the more I have a bad day or whatever, the more I learn, like, okay, I know what my tools are. I know what movie I have to watch. I know, like, which friends to call. I know, like, how many hours to spend eating in bed, watching TV. Like, you just kind of, it's all just getting to know yourself, which sucks because then by the time you know yourself as fully as you possibly can, like, at the oldest you can possibly be, you die. But I will be fine. <laughs> Real talk. <laughs> uh, Rookie's such a great publication, and people really respond to it. I know I respond to it because it includes so much writing and so much artwork that's so personal. Um, you also write for the site, and obviously tonight you shared a lot of really personal things with us. Um, how do you decide which parts of your life to share with the public and which parts to keep private? I think um, for me, I find the plane on which people relate to each other is feelings more than it is experience. So it's easier for me to write about, to talk about being depressed as like a thing that happened in my life than to really give details. I think because now there's so much writing on the internet that does that. And sometimes it's really strong and honest and really amazing because, okay, I feel like pieces on the internet that get really confessional are great when they seem to do some, a kind of service to the reader. Um, one of our writers wrote an amazing piece on sexual assault that's like, 
this is what you go through, this is how you might deal with it, whatever. To me, that's different from just like live journaling or tumbling, and which is fine. Uh, I'm not saying that that stuff is bad. Yeah, but I have as a live editor, journal on Tumblr. Jay, thanks, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> no, but as like a writer, I prefer to talk about feelings instead. I don't know. Just whenever I end up writing about, if I were to like give you the details of my breakup, it would seem like kind of weirdly self-serving and like I need to see a therapist and not talk to you all about this. So for me, it was better to just be like, this happened. You understand that that's an awful thing. Now we move on. So I guess, I don't know. But weirdly, I think the things that I share that are, or that I keep to myself that are personal are less like the sad things like breakup or depression and more just like the really special things. Um, and I mean, the same month I started Rookie, I became obsessed with journaling. So I think it's just important to me because I have grown up online to have these really, these special moments to myself in a way. Yep. And I suppose one of the things about Rookie, I mean, it's extremely popular um, and it is a really positive and kind of, I guess, supportive publication that there's so much experience on there that people can relate to, that readers can relate to. Um, and although you've kind of talked tonight about, you know, the enthusiasm of fangirling, you must also deal with some negativity in terms of um, people criticising your work and what you do. Um, what have you learned about dealing with negative comments or negative people? To not look at it. I think criticism comes, I think Kathleen Hanna said this, where she was like, she was like, whenever I start to feel insecure because I'm like reading stuff about myself online, I'm just like, would Beyonce be doing this? No, she would close the computer and go be awesome. <laughs> so I, th she says like, it comes with, yeah, criticism comes with the territory, absolutely, but you don't have to seek it out. You know, it's not like, an innate part of creating and sharing things that you have to give value to every single comment someone just like half typed on a YouTube comment section. I just, I don't know. I find comfort in knowing that whenever I have met people in person who are like writers or whatever, and I know that they've written something negative about me, they either become super nice because they feel bad or they're just really awkward and uncomfortable and I'm standing there and I'm fine. So like, I don't know, you just can't, there's always gonna be that. Every wonderful, wonderful artist that you like, you look them up, you will see something negative. So for me, yeah, there's criticism, but like that's why Rookie has a comment section. That's why all of the editors have emails. If someone really truly had a problem with like the ethics of our publication, there are a lot of ways they could come to us instead of just being like, Duh, YouTube. So, <laughs> I don't know. I just, yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, one thing, uh, when I went to Fashion Week and I had my blog and stuff, a lot of like old school fashion editors were really mad that I was able to have these opportunities from a blog. And um, I just, you know, I for a lot of time, I was just like, yeah, I understand. Like, I would be mad too. I, uh, I'm sorry. And then eventually I was just like, you are a grown woman. Why are you so attacked by a 12 year old success? Like, you should not be making this personal. So I just kind of, and that's when I started dressing all obnoxiously and like, I don't know. I had fun. I don't care. <laughs> Whatever. Be Beyonce, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I guess on the more personal side of that kind of question, um, obviously you're super successful. Um, Rookie is great. And... Um, Lots of us probably found out about you through your original blog, which is also great. But can I ask you about how you personally deal with your own um, kind of mistakes or what you might perceive as things that you haven't done as well as you'd like? Um, well, most of the time when I regret something, I really try to get myself back to the mindset that 
made that decision. And I often find that there's just no way I could have known. Um, and, you know, I, not that I, you shouldn't take responsibility for your actions, but, and not to be like, YOLO, no regrets, summer 2013. But, like, <laughs> I just think I've just had to, I mean, this is hard because, like, I'm a massive overachiever. I, like, lost the spelling bee in second grade and, like, ran down the aisle. But, like, I've... So I've just had to learn to be easy on myself and relax and just move on and finally submit to, like, the quotations tag on Pinterest and be like, yeah, inspiration. <laughs> um, because you really do just have to be easy on yourself. I think if I, you know, make a mistake in which someone's genuinely hurt... Like, I write something that's irresponsible or ignorant. I think you read the criticism, you thank people for it, and you apologize, and you change your ways. Um, I mean, the weird thing about, like, celebrity apologies, there's just a piece about this by Roxanne Gay, who's a rookie writer, but she didn't write it for rookie. But it's a great piece. And she's like, they only, you know, celebrity apologies are, like, to clear up PR messes because people often don't learn from their mistakes. So I think learn as much as you possibly can. She should do with everything. But I just, I can't, like, go back to eighth grade self-loathing and, like, beating myself up over it. You just have to move on. I don't know. Yeah, because there's a lot of things you can't control. Like, there's only yeah. so much stuff you can do. We all die one day. <laughs> so I keep bringing Second that time up. she said it, guys. It's, okay, um, David Wilson, the guy from the Museum of Jurassic Technology, he, over like a doorway in the museum, they have Memento Mori, I think. And when I interviewed him, he told me about this philosopher who was like, we should be reminding ourselves of death at all times. And it seems morbid, but it's just so that you do make, you know, prioritize the things that make you happy and are important to you and can kind of let go the daily embarrassment of being a human. So, yeah. Or, <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Just do what I do. Imagine the person you hate the most doing a poo. Um, <laughs> that's an amazing tactic. I'm so using that. I don't actually do that. <laughs> um, rookie Yearbook One is out now. Um, mm. Who's got a copy? I've got a copy. You guys all have a copy. I expected some, like, applause or something. Maybe I was mumbling. Yeah. Um, and Rookie Year Book 2 is about to be finished, right? Or it about is to be printed? It is to the printers. Yeah. yeah, it comes out October 1st, but I, you might get it a little later here, but you can order it online. Yeah. What can we expect from the second edition? I would say the Rookie Year Book 1 I would describe as four teenage girls and the second one I might describe as more for teenagers. Um, you know, there are articles on really what it means to be a girl. But I think, you know, it's less, I think aesthetically it's less, uh, it's still very DIY feeling and decorated, but it's just not as like girly and glittery. And I also think it's, um, you know, more articles about family and kind of neutral things that are less gender specific, I think. Yeah. Than cool. the first one. Very exciting. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm going to ask the house to put the lights up, please, because we now have time for some audience questions. Okay, we've got a question down here, red top, maybe. Um, my question is, what was it like to meet Taylor Swift? <laughs> 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 like, um, being such a big fan and now yeah. you're like, Friends, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I, um, well, yeah, it was like we met on a level that was kind of like had dinner with mutual friends, so I had to be kind of like, yes, we're peers. Um, <laughs> but she's a really, you know, she's just what you would expect. She's lovely, totally genuine, so funny and quick and, um, you know, eased my nerves right away. And, um, you know, she was a, a good gal to uh, <laughs> consult on the breakup front. 
Like, her music and her words of wisdom. Um, so, yeah, no, but I, I have to really, you know, there's no gross, non-gross way to talk about this. I'm sorry. But as we have become friends, um, I, yeah, I don't know. That thing, that stuff just kind of goes away and you separate it more. Because even though I think she's, you know, really a very similar person in both sides of her life, um, there is, like, the fangirling thing that creates this different person. So that just doesn't really, that, like, had to go away. That's okay, because she's a wonderful person. But, yeah. Did she wear a really big dress to do well? Um, she had uh, come from, like, the Teen Choice Awards or something, so she had, like, a, a nice little, like, uh, I don't know the names of things. It was a white dress. It was, like, to here. It was cute. <laughs> she looked good. Really weird question for me, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Hands up again. Anyone's got a question? Um... I have to ask about your cataloging, and I don't really know how to phrase this question, but um, I read on your blog once that it was sort of a way of making... You said that if you didn't create sort of something tangible, it was like something hadn't happened. Right. Um, was that the start of it, or, like, I know... It, one of the first things I do when I'm creatively stunted is I create a list, like just sort of what is your motivation behind the cataloging? First of all, at first I thought you said like cattling. And I was like, I am so sorry you thought you were coming to a farming convention. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, well, yeah, no, I always go back and forth between being like, um, Ugh, like, there's a part in the finale of Six Feet Under where a girl is about to take a picture of the family for the last time. And this guy's like, you can't take a picture of this. It's already gone. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I go through phases of being like, mortality, and just being like, live in the moment. But I always find myself kind of going crazy when I don't journal because it is a really good way to just, like, collect your thoughts and evaluate how you feel. And I think... um I don't know. I mean, I don't think journaling and cataloging and recording everything is like the opposite of living. I think it's part of living. Making art is part of living. So, yeah. The end. <laughs> I, I go back and forth. Okay, we might go up to level three. Um, so my question is, look, I consider myself to be an opto-realist, which in my mind, is an optimist, well, a perpetual optimist who's been bitch-slapped a lot by reality. Um, and look... Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, my life's pretty good, so it's fine. Um, but uh, basically, going through teenage years can certainly be um, a, like a, a difficult journey and um, keeping in touch with reality and trying to keep optimistic can be very, very difficult. Do you have any um, advice for young people to, you know, what would you say to young, a young person who struggles with those sorts of things? A young person who's what? Sorry. Who struggles with those sorts of things or what's, what's your best piece of advice for getting through those teenage years? Um, it does suck. Uh, we just had... I have, like, a new mantra that came from a rookie commenter because um, every week we have these diaries that uh, four different girls write. Four or five? There's an illustrator, too. And um, one of them had an entry about, you know, starting school again and how it is awful and makes her really miserable. And someone just said, like, people care, things matter, there are good days. And, yeah, it does take a lot of optimism, but... Yeah, people care, like, they're people in your life, and things do matter because if they make you feel something, they matter. And there are good days, and, it, you know, it's worth it, even if they're kind of few and far between. Um, I mean, it sucks, but it's also... The teacher who does the feelings class, he has the story about how when he was a teenager, everyone had, like, really nice clothes from, like, Ralph Lauren, and he had to shop at Walmart. And his dad would, like, drag him to Walmart, and he was like, no, uh, what if I'm at Walmart and someone sees me? And then he was like, wait a minute. If 
For someone to see me at Walmart, they too would be at Walmart. <laughs> so we're all in Walmart together. So like being a teenager, being a person can be, you know, embarrassing and sad and weird, but it, like we're all in the same boat, I think. So if that helps. Do you think um, uh, being passionate and really focusing on what is passionate um, will help you a lot with that sort of stuff? Yeah, I just think it's good to like things. And it is something where, I mean, it is important because then you're at school and you're like, why don't I care about the same things my classmates care about? And you have to be like, but I have these other things that make me really happy. And you have to give importance to those things because if not, you might be sad, <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay, hands up. We've got second level. Um, thanks for your talk, it was, yeah, it was very interesting. Um, I'm older than you and I feel a bit upset that I haven't achieved what you have. <laughs> and I think like more than half the room feels Holla. like that. <laughs> um, but my question to you is that you got so much success at such a young age and I want to know how you've remained level-headed throughout that. Um... I'm not level-headed, I'm a genius. I, I don't, I'm, um, I mean, I have to go back to school after that. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, I think I'm, that helps balance things, like still living in a suburb of Chicago with my family, with my room, um, and seeing friends and, um, you know, sometimes the contrast can be a bit jarring, but you just have, I've just had to learn to love the kind of complexity of that. And um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, Walmart, things are still hard, I think. Um, and I think my level of success has brought on its own challenges. So I think, you know, uh, there are things that, uh, I don't know, bring me back down to earth or whatever. Um, I don't know. I think I'm also, like, I did not a radio interview the other day where the guy was like, there's this whole history of, like, child stars and young, successful people who, like, kill themselves and who do all these bad things and hate themselves and grow up and have a really hard time. And it's like, yeah, there is that history. Right now, I am alive and I can look at that history and kind of see what went wrong and be conscious of that. So uh, I just try to think about things and not be rude to people. Um, where's, where's Steve Gevinson? Steve Gevinson is Tavi's dad and uh, I don't know, have you guys all seen the Ask a Grown Man segment where, <laughs> yeah. So, Tavi, do you ever just say to Steve, sometimes like, Steve's like, Tavi, can you clean your room? You're like, um, I don't know, Dad. Uh, did you know I'm like the future of journalism? Do you ever say that? <laughs> no, but if I'm really stressed out, I'll be like, Sorry, I'm, like, responsible for people with Rookie. No one really cares about my room. Like, I have to do this right now. It's kind of that thing. But I try to not be a brat. But it's also, like, I, some pressures are more pressing than others. <laughs> um, okay, so we've probably got time for one or two quick, more quick questions. But just a reminder that um, I know you probably all want to have a chat to Tavi. She'll be signing books outside afterwards in the auditorium. So you will have a chance to say hello to her then. So, yeah, just down here, um, maybe this row down here. Hi, Tavi. Um, I just wanted to know what are your ambitions for the future and your goals, say, for example, when you're 30 or something? Um, I have recently... <laughs> what? I didn't hear that. Be cool. Oh, I just said, I'm 30. Be cool. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I... 
I've recently been admitting that I have a folder on my desktop called World Domination. But I also, <laughs> at the same time, it's like, you know, when I go back from this visit, I will be starting my last year of high school. Then I'll take a year off and then I'll go to college. And I have no clue. I, f I feel like I could, I, I really don't know. I just want... I just find myself experiencing things like with fangirling where you're like, oh, everything I should do, I should work every day towards maintaining this feeling. And um, sometimes that seems to align with continuing with what I do now. And sometimes it seems like the right thing is to go to college and like study and be alone and away from things. So I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we had super quick put hands over there. Um, loved your speech. It was awesome. Thank I you. just wanted to say I really liked um, and I could really relate with the part about relating to light um, when you're watching sort of cinema or reading books and different ambience, I guess. Um, and I was just wondering if you've seen A Single Man by Tom Ford. Cause I still haven't seen that one. In there, I really relate to the fact that when he has really beautiful memories, he, like Tom Ford, makes the scene light up in like golden glow. Mm. But that wasn't actually my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also love Beyonce, probably as much as you do. Okay. Um, and I was wondering oh, if you'd sorry. like to come back to <laughs> Australia. <laughs> Would you like to come back to Australia later on this year when I'm having a Beyonce party? <laughs> Please do. So much, but I just don't know if it's realistic. But would I like to? Yes. Can I? I don't know. But thank you. Thanks, Tavi. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>